Details on the span and scope of Mueller's investigation into Michael Cohen and why the pros believe, based on so many pages we're not allowed to see, that there's still more to come. Tonight, one FBI veteran says the president might have a lot to worry about from this case. Plus, why suddenly Rod Rosenstein has decided to stay longer at the Department of Justice. Is his departure being held up pending the release of a Mueller report? And could the effort to do away with the Electoral College ever really succeed as the 11th hour gets underway on a Tuesday night? Well, good evening once again from our NBC News headquarters here in New York. Day 789 of the Trump administration and against all we don't know about the Mueller investigation and a subsequent Mueller report. Just today, some newly released documents are revealing details about the earliest stages of the investigation into this man, former Trump lawyer Michael Cohen. Hundreds of pages of court documents concerning Cohen were unsealed today. It's a lot. It shows Mueller team started requesting search warrants just two months after Robert Mueller was appointed to the job in May 2017. Prosecutors in the FBI received permission to execute search warrants for Cohen's two Gmail accounts and stored data in his iCloud account. That was July, August, and November of 2017. Mueller was seeking evidence of Cohen's involvement in a number of potential crimes, including acting as an unregistered foreign agent and violating the Foreign Agents Registration Act, or FARA, that first warrant specifically sought communications, records, documents, and other files involving Essential Consultants, LLC. That's the name of the shell company that Cohen set up week, weeks before the 2016 election for the purpose of funneling hush money to Stormy Daniels. Cohen was never charged with violating the Foreign Agents Act, and it's not clear if Mueller is still pursuing that particular angle. We do know that in February of 2018, the special counsel ultimately referred, quote, certain aspects of the Cohen case to the Fed's New York office, otherwise known as the Southern District of New York. That eventually led to the FBI's April 9, 2018 search of Cohen's home and office, and that prompted this reaction from President Trump. I just heard that they broke into the office of one of my personal attorneys, good man, and uh, it's a disgraceful situation. It's a total witch hunt. I heard it like you did. I said, that is really now in a whole new level of unfairness. This is the most uh, uh, biased group of people. These people have the biggest conflicts of interest I've ever seen. They only keep looking at us, so they find no collusion. And then they go from there and they say, well, let's keep going. And they raid an office of a personal attorney early in the morning. Uh, and I think it's a disgrace. It's a, an attack on our country in a true sense. Earlier on this network, a former chief counsel for the Senate Judiciary Committee was asked about Trump's reaction to the Cohen search. He's always known that he is incredibly vulnerable from the material that Michael Cohen has. He was still at the same time writing hush money checks That's right. as president of the United States to reimburse Michael Cohen, the good man. He was in the middle of a criminal conspiracy as president of the United States. He knew that. Last year, Michael Cohen pleaded guilty to tax violations, lying to a bank, lying to Congress, and to arranging hush money payments during the campaign to women who claimed they once had affairs with Donald Trump. Much of the part of today's filings that deals with those payments, or what it calls the illegal campaign contribution scheme, remains a mystery, 18 pages in all redacted. As we await special counsel Mueller's next move, NBC News is reporting Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein, who first appointed Mueller, let's not forget, and has been on his way out, now intends to stay on at the Justice Department a little longer. Period of time undefined. The department refused comment when asked if that meant that Mueller is not yet ready to deliver a report. However, we did learn today that Mueller's team has asked for an extension to respond to a request from the Washington 
Washington Post for court documents related to the Paul Manafort case. The Mueller team filing indicated it won't be able to meet a deadline this week in part because of the, quote, press of other work. We just don't know how much to read into that. Meanwhile, the head of the House Intelligence Committee, the Democrat from California, Adam Schiff, has his own concerns about the scope of Mueller's investigation. Schiff tells NBC News he's worried that, quote, the president has tried to draw a red line around certain aspects of his finances. Chairman also says he intends to have his committee focus on whether Trump or anyone around him is under the influence of a foreign government. Former FBI Assistant Director for Counterintelligence Frank Figluzzi warns this scrutiny from Congress as well as from federal and state agencies will make life increasingly challenging for Donald Trump. He should be worried right now because the, the worst decision he's ever made has been to accept the nomination of his party for presidency of the United States. He, he is looking at the destruction of his organization, his foundation, certainly his presidency and its legacy, and possibly even criminal exposure for family members. He should be worried every day. On that note, let's bring in our lead-off panel on a Tuesday night. Jeremy Bash, former chief of staff at the CIA and Pentagon, former chief counsel for House Intel. Barbara McQuaid, veteran federal prosecutor, former U.S. attorney for the Eastern District of the State of Michigan. And Clint Watts is here. He's a former FBI special agent, an expert in this area, and the author of Messing with the Enemy, Surviving in a Social Media World of Hackers, Terrorists, Russians, and Fake News. Uh, Clint, I'd like to begin with you. Talk having gone on uh, raids like this. Talk about the underpinning documents and what you read in here, what they were looking for, timing. What stands out to you here? I think the thing that stands out the most is how quickly this came after the special counsel essentially started. That is a book, essentially, of documents. Uh, this does not happen overnight. I, I would imagine that they were already looking into Cohen somewhere in the FBI or some sort of investigative apparatus. And what you learn in that is that within 60 days, they had gone up on multiple email accounts and they were looking for very specific things. Uh, they had fraud down there. They had foreign influence. And so when you look at that stack and how quickly that occurred. Remember when you rewind to the summer before, they were talking about Russian influence and there were four people that were essentially named as coming, being the targets of a FISA. Now you're looking at a hard search warrant that is being filed within two months of the council starting. The first two weeks is where the office is at and where, how do we get everybody in a room. That is a pretty remarkable turnaround. And the other thing that we always need to remember are there are always two people in an investigation that uh, are essentially the choke points for investigations, lawyers and accountants. That's where the finances flow through. That's where the communications go through. And here you see the president's lawyer being looked at in a very detailed way, looking at very specific months. And you see a pen register being used, which really shows where the incoming and outgoing phone calls are from those communications. Let me stop you right there. This term pen register sounds uh, quaint from the old days of does, law enforcement. Yeah. If you've crossed the threshold with a judge, the judge is saying, I'm going to allow you to listen into phone calls. Why would you opt for a pen register and please define that versus a straight up wiretap? Right. A pen register does not allow you to listen to phone calls. It just allows you to see incoming and outgoing phone So you calls. log numbers. Yes. And so you can see who is calling in and who is calling out. That usually is a less intrusive search warrant. Uh, it's a less intrusive means of search. Meaning Easier to get from a judge? It's easier to get from a judge than actually going in and doing what's known as a Title III or a wire, as you'll commonly hear it referred to in the criminal code. And so what they're doing is trying to build a case for going to more intrusive methods. Uh, whatever they decided to do, which is, is kind of interesting because we don't see a Title III application for going up on a wire. All you see is a pen register in this, is they either got what they wanted in this case or when they did the raid on Cohen's office, they got everything that they needed. And so there is no indication that uh, anyone in the White House orbit was being tapped, which is also a question that we have to ask. Probably Special Counsel Mueller is very in tune of this. To do that very intrusive method, you'd have to say there is no other way I can find this evidence unless I go for this method. Mm -hmm. It seems in this case they did not need to do it, or at least we don't know about it at this point. Jeremy Bash, let's take a second and remind people choice of words here. The president called this a break-in of Cohen's offices. Rudy Giuliani, former U.S. attorney, referred to the FBI as stormtroopers. With that in mind, what stands out to you in these hundreds of pages? Well, these investigative tactics, Brian, were conducted under the purview of a court, under the purview of a 
uh, Article Three judge uh, in which uh, in which uh, wa warrants were obtained after the government showed particularity. They showed with specificity and predication the things to be seized and searched and the places and manner that the searches would be conducted. So this was no uh, violation of the law. In fact, this was upholding the law in the way we want our federal government to do so. I would just add to Clint's point, though, that there may be things that we don't know about. There could have also been a FISA warrant, a national security warrant, up, up on potentially Michael Cohen if the feds suspected that he was working in conjunction with the Russian Federation in the aftermath of, say, the Moscow Trump Tower deal. And Clint, what would that mean? That would mean that it's a, almost a dual case in the sense that uh, what you saw there with a pen register, the uh, warrants they were found were really in the criminal code. If it goes to national security, any tie to a foreign influence or a foreign country, then it goes to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which is really part of the national security branch of the FBI. So it could be something done in parallel whenever it ties into a foreign power. And now to the former U.S. attorney among us, and that's you, Barb, and the, 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 we hate the black pages of redaction around here, but the judge explained the page that were blank today they had to do with campaign finance uh, hush money quote this is federal judge William Pauley at this stage wholesale disclosure of the materials would reveal the scope and direction of the government's ongoing investigation it would also unveil subjects of the investigation and the potential conduct under scrutiny Barb what does that tell you yeah, I thought the redacted pages spoke more loudly than any other page among these uh, disclosed documents today. 18 pages. Uh, what it says is they're still investigating either additional crimes or additional defendants. The fact that Michael Cohen has now been prosecuted, pleaded guilty and sentenced suggests to me that what they're looking at is other defendants. And it is under that category of illegal cam campaign contribution scheme. And so what we know about that scheme so far is that Michael Cohen has admitted to being involved with paying hush money and involving AMI, the National Enquirer, David Pecker, President Trump, and Donald Trump Jr. We know that AMI and David Pecker have entered into non-prosecution agreements or immunity agreements. That leaves President Trump and Donald Trump Jr. as potential targets of that investigation. Maybe other people we don't know about yet, but the fact that the judge made that finding and continued to keep that part redacted, which requires a showing before they're going to do that, suggests to me that there are individuals under investigation that could include those two that uh, are yet to be charged. And Barb, we tend to forget, at least on our part, we tend to not repeat often enough. Southern District of New York, during Cohen's plea in court, didn't they say that he admitted to crimes that were done at the direction of individual one, later identified as our president? Yes, um, it says even in, in the document itself that it was at the uh, in direction of and in coordination with individual one. Uh, people have said that is you know, akin to saying he is an unindicted co-conspirator there. Uh, you know, then we run up against this whole idea of whether a sitting president can be charged. So it could relate to President Trump himself. It could relate to other people who were involved in this scheme. And based on the judge's statements, Robert Mueller continues to look at that piece of of the investigation. Uh, Clint, I'm, I'm with Barbara. When you hear the judge talk about uh, additional subjects of the investigation, it, I, I don't mean to be smart, it doesn't sound like a witch hunt, does it? No, it sounds like a broad-based investigation looking at multiple points of entry. And we already know this. I, th I think it, what we learn from each piece of this case that sort of reveals itself is that this is already splintered in many different directions. Uh, you learn that the Southern District of New York was, it, it appears most likely from this, already looking into those campaign finance violations or some sort of violation in New York separate from the special counsel's office. So when you look at how this branches out. This book, essentially, of search warrants that we look at here today is expansive and deep. And just, I would like to add one thing about the pen register and how they play together, just for the audience. So a pen register allows you to see phone numbers coming in and going mm -hmm. out, but that also informs who is, the, is actually communicating in and out with Cohen. So if it's an overseas target that relates to a foreign power, that can el at least give you the probable cause to look into or use a FISA or a Title III wire if it's a criminal case. So that's how these sort of 
they're playing together, their steps in the chain, but one oftentimes leads to another if they need to pursue that investigation further. Jeremy Bash, as you saw, it took Ron Klain to kind of remind everybody in this very studio earlier today, oh yeah, it's alleged the president was making these payments while president during this period. That's right. And so his presidential conduct, I think, is, is of acute interest to Mueller and, of course, to congressional investigators. But I think it's also important to note that in the, in the uh, initial months of the Trump presidency and even on this broadcast, Brian, in 2017, we knew about Michael Cohen's role facilitating the real estate deal in Moscow. We knew of the role that Michael Cohen was playing as a conduit between the Russian Federation and the Trump Organization. So when we now know that the FBI and the special counsel was looking intensively at Michael Cohen in early 2017, that tells me they were intensively looking at the Trump Organization and Donald Trump himself as well. And Barb, you get the last word. What does it tell you that Rosenstein is staying, even if for a day? Uh, I think it says that the Mueller investigation may be extending a little bit longer than we thought. Two other clues that we got uh, in recent days today in, in this fi uh, finding by the judge, he permitted Robert Mueller an additional 60 days before he has to come back and discuss whether those redactions will continue. 60 days was also the amount of time Robert Mueller asked for to extend the sentencing date for R Richard Gates. That gets us to about May 15th. And Ros Rod Rosenstein staying on a little longer than expected. Maybe all those things are coinciding with the end of the Mueller investigation. Oh, that's very crafty of you. It's why we've invited the very best guests in television to Jeremy Bash, to Barbara McQuaid, to Clint Watts. Our thanks for starting off our conversation tonight and coming up. One of the biggest names in the president's circle is the third wheel in an increasingly nasty skirmish between her boss and her spouse. And later, you may have heard the president mention the Electoral College a time or two tonight, why Democrats are talking about it in a different way. The 11th hour just getting started on a Tuesday night. President Trump is now going after the husband of Kellyanne Conway, one of his longest serving and top White House aides. Earlier today, he called the prominent conservative D.C. lawyer George Conway, quote, a total loser. Trump was responding to a post from his campaign manager that said, quote, we all know that Donald Trump turned down Mr. Kellyanne Conway for a job he desperately wanted. Now he hurts his wife because he is jealous of her success. POTUS doesn't even know him. George Conway is a frequent critic of Donald Trump, and as we mentioned here last night, he posted the diagnostic criteria for narcissistic personality disorder and antisocial personality disorder after Trump's weekend tweet storm. Well, today, the Washington Post published a new interview with George Conway, pointing out, among other things, of course, the president knows him. He points to a number of notable interactions with Trump over the past decade. Conway also said that he was the one to turn down a job at DOJ. The Post also reports, quote, Conway suggested his own tweets questioning the president's mental health were aimed in part at avoiding conflicts with his wife. It's so maddening to watch, said Conway. The mendacity, the incompetence, it's just maddening to watch. The tweeting is just the way to get it out of the way so I can get it off my chest and move on with my life that day. That's basically it. Frankly, it's so I don't end up screaming at her, his wife, about it. Earlier today, former FBI Assistant Director for Counterintelligence, Frank Figluzzi, who we heard from earlier, offered this analysis on Conway's posts about Trump's mental health. If this were somebody else, what I would be thinking about would be what behavioralists uh, talk about as the pathway to violence. There's a flashpoint that has warning signs and indicators before it occurs, and it involves obsessive behavior and brooding on one issue, the inability to step back and see reality for what it is. Where is this going? I, I'm concerned about where it's going because on a workplace violence level, it would be headed toward violence. Uh, if you're president of the United States, that flashpoint could look like something that, that is completely unexpected on the world scene or on the national scene, and that's what should be troubling us about Con what Conway is warning us about. 
with us for more tonight and returning to our broadcast from maternity leave and months on end without sleep. Ashley Parker, Pulitzer <laughs> Prize winning White House reporter for The Washington Post and Robert Costa, national political reporter also with The Washington Post. He is also moderator of Washington Week on PBS and during a good week he doesn't sleep much either. Uh, Ashley, welcome back. It's great to see you and, and I guess I'll start with by saying if this is couples performance art it is of the hyper uncomfortable look away variety. Um, what do you think is at work here? And I know you have a, a very, very uh, 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 memorable vignette from election night regarding this couple. Yeah, that's true. So on election night, uh, I was in the ballroom, the Midtown ballroom um, for President Trump's party, and I was standing there in George Conway. Once it became clear that Trump was going to win, he came barreling in, and tears were just streaming down his face. He was standing with a group of people next to me, and he was sort of weeping with joy and pride and saying, she did it, she did it, um, referring to his wife, Kellyanne Conway, and saying, you know, she managed this campaign, she got him elected, and he was just so deeply proud and, and truly happy for her in that moment. So it's sort of striking to see how things seem to, at least from a public point of view, descended in just those two years. And so when you ask, is this sort of performance art for the Trumpian era, uh, it's a great question. It's something I've been asking. Is this sort of the James Carville, Mary Madeline shtick? Um, and the people in the president's orbit I've talked to have said no. Again, if you're not in a marriage, you don't know exactly what's going on. But they have said that, that this is, their sense is this is real. And these are actually tension points, and it's not just something to, you know, give them a, a book deal or, or a TV deal after they leave the White House, or after she leaves the White House, rather. Robert, here's how your colleagues at The Post uh, reported one of these interactions between George Conway and Donald Trump. In a conversation with Trump at the wedding of Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin in ju uh, June 2017, Conway said, Trump approached him and complimented him for not taking a job under then Attorney General Jeff Sessions. He said to me, I remember it clearly, you were smart not to work for that guy, Conway said. He is so weak. Trump then complained for several minutes that Sessions should have never recused himself from the Mueller investigation, Conway said. I told him I'd heard the recusal issue was pretty clear, that Sessions had to recuse himself, Conway said. He took great affront at that. Uh, Robert, what's the lesson of that interaction and what do you think is going on here? Those scenes with President Trump are common when you talk to top Republicans in Washington. But this situation with Mr. Conway is a revealing microcosm into the Republican Civil War. So many Republicans recount these kind of scenes, often privately to reporters, about how they see the president operate in unorthodox ways in their interactions when the, clo the doors are closed. But they choose to continue to support him publicly because they've made a political bargain, in some ways a personal bargain, that despite his behavior, his conduct, some of which they criticize in severe ways, they feel he is responsible for bringing along conservatives on the Supreme Court. He provided a tax cut and tax overhaul law that Republicans are pleased with. And so they've accepted his behavior. But Republicans like Bill Kristol, the Never Trump movement, Mr. Conway, they do not accept it and they publicly rail against it. Those are the fault lines, but those scenes, both sides say, they happen with frequency. And Ashley, this public airing of a diagnosis from a physician's handbook, for a long time it was Michael Moore, it was Bill Maher, and kind of that corner of the public realm using diagnoses like uh, malignant narcissism. Now we have a respected D.C. attorney who happens to be married to the, one of the longest serving uh, aides to this president just posting diagnosis. And this is all in the public realm now. That's right, and that's what's so striking. If you look at George Conway's earlier criticisms of the president, they sort of started out in his area of expertise, uh, legal criticisms, criticisms from the point of view of a constitutional conservative. Um, and then you saw him delving into uh, mental health diagnoses. And that is seems to be one of the things that possibly got under the president's skin. Our understanding is that the president has long been deeply frustrated um, with George Conway's tweets and his public pronouncements and his sort of 
gleeful willingness um, to take on his wife's boss. But the attacks from George Conway recently got more personal. And even though you still had aides urging the president not to attack him publicly, not to tweet back, it, it seems like sort of this personal level of attack and ratcheting it up is what prompted the president to ultimately respond in kind. Robert, we're coming to you on the other side of the break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about this. Trump once again lashing out at the memory of the late Senator John McCain, this time from the Oval Office in response to a direct question. We mentioned this before the break, President Trump once again attacking the late Senator John McCain nearly seven months after his death. It was earlier today at the White House, our own Kristen Welker asked Trump about why he attacked McCain over the weekend. I'm very unhappy that he didn't repeal and replace Obamacare, as you know. He campaigned on repealing and replacing Obamacare for years. And then he got to a vote and he said, thumbs down. And our country would have saved a trillion dollars and we would have had great health care. Uh, so he campaigned. He told us hours before that he was going to repeal and replace. And then for some reason, I think I understand the reason, he ended up going thumbs up. And frankly, had we even known that, I think we would have gotten a vote because we could have gotten somebody else. So I, did, I think that's disgraceful. Uh, plus, there are other things. I was never a fan of John McCain, and I never will be. Senator Mitt Romney, who, like McCain and Trump, held the title of Republican Party presidential nominee, weighed in on this today, saying, quote, I can't understand why the president would once again disparage a man as exemplary as my friend John McCain. Heroic, courageous, patriotic, honorable, self-effacing, self-sacrificing, empathetic, and driven by duty to family, God, a country, and God. Still with us are Ashley Parker and Robert Costa of the Washington Post. Robert, uh, everyone should know by now, but it bears repeating, uh, John McCain was tortured for the better part, the worst part, actually, of six years in the Hanoi Hilton, at times driven only by love of country to survive, to make it through to the next day. At the risk of going into even more psychiatric diagnosis, trace the antipathy that Donald Trump has for John McCain, where does it go to? How far back? It goes back decades, at least to 1999, when then businessman Donald Trump was flirting with the White House bid. Senator McCain was running for the White House at the time, ahead of the 2000 election. In an interview, television interview at the time, uh, Mr. Trump said he couldn't believe how McCain could be a hero because he was captured. The same language he used years later in 2015 when he was sitting with the Republican pollster Frank Luntz at an Iowa event. Uh, comments back in 2015 that many in the Republican establishment, some people forget, thought would end uh, Mr. Trump's campaign, but he was only fueled uh, by that incident, continued to grow popular within the Republican Party. This is a, a president and a politician who is unapologetic about these incendiary views about a late senator. He does not apologize. People inside of the White House tell us uh, they can't control his rhetoric on Senator McCain. It's been a fixation for the president for years. And there's no real answer or solution from those close to him. Ashley Parker, how do military vets uh, who make up a large portion of the president's base react? How do fellow Republicans react? And harder still, how do Republicans working in the West Wing for this guy react to this, uh, all of this episode? Well, what's interesting here is the president does a number of things, says a number of things um, that, that are outlandish and scandalous and controversial. Um, but when it comes to Senator McCain, even people inside of the White House find this deeply uncomfortable. A lot of the people um, in his orbit in the White House sort of share the same sentiment that Senator Romney expressed publicly. Now, they don't necessarily express it publicly, but when he goes after McCain, uh, which he did when the senator was alive, and especially now that the senator has passed, there's just a level of unease and discomfort and, you know, people in the White House and people in the Republican establishment, even if they disagreed with McCain on some issues, they respected um, his service to the country and the military in the Senate um, in running for president. And it's just not how they want to see the president act. Uh, is there any provable upside if you're Donald Trump, Ashley, and, and let's assume people have maybe approached him and said, boss, you might want to lay off this line of reasoning. Is there any upside to Donald Trump? It's 
It's hard to see the upside right now, um, especially after McCain is is dead. Um, he's you know, and and healthcare is a dead issue as well. The president is relitigating things um, with a man who can no longer fight back, um, and th there's just about no one in his orbit who thinks it is effective um, politically or in any other way. Perhaps the personal upside for President Trump is he likes to vent, he likes to get stuff off his chest and it gives him something of a relief valve, but, but I think there is no one who is telling him that yes, this is a good strategy. This is the question you should be responding to while sitting next to the president of Brazil. And Robert, the question I try to ask at least once a week, you get the first asking for this week. How did the Trump agenda advance today in Washington? The most interesting event today was the meeting with the Brazilian leader, Bolsonaro. You have a far-right populist connecting with a conservative Republican populist in President Trump. We often talk about Brexit and the struggles in the UK, the rise of nationalism in Western Europe, the nationalistic agenda going on with Xi Jinping in China. But pay attention, too. To, to the south, to our southern border and beyond. There is nationalism rising there. And to have that kind of amiable relationship between the head of Brazil and the head of the United States, uh, that tells you a lot about where global politics are going. It's much more than the Mueller report and all of this uh, news we're covering here. There's, a, there's forces far beyond the, this country that are growing in strength and have real consequences for the global economy and global discourse. Two of the best informed and hardest working reporters on this story and in Washington, Ashley Parker, Robert Costa, our thanks to you both as always. Coming up, an interesting incident in federal court today in a case against Donald Trump. Some President Trump has been accused of profiting off of his presidency and today a lawsuit to determine if he violated the Constitution reached its highest level thus far. At issue is the rarely used emoluments clause which basically says the president can't accept money from a foreign state. In this case a lawsuit filed by the attorneys general of DC and Maryland point to the profits brought in by the Trump International Hotel. It's just down the street from the White House. It's the landmark converted former post office building just steps from the mall, a popular spot for visiting foreign governments. The future of this case seems uncertain right now, however. Josh Gerstein of Politico, who was in the courtroom and waiting to join us in just a moment, wrote today, quote, a federal appeals court panel was indisputably hostile Tuesday to a lawsuit accusing President Donald Trump of violating the Constitution. The uphill battle the suit faces was evident before the arguments even began when it was revealed that all three Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals judges assigned to the case our GOP appointees. Back with us tonight, Josh Gerstein, senior legal affairs contributor for Politico. So Josh, take us into the courtroom, starting with the entrance of these three jurists, and why was even that a surprise to counsel? Well, uh, counsel, I think, got their first indication uh, of what kind of a battle this was going to be uh, just minutes before the judges actually entered the courtroom uh, on some boards outside the courtroom. They post the names of the judges, and in a lot of courts, those names are available for a week or more before arguments. The Fourth Circuit happens to do it this way. Uh, maybe it's a bit old-fashioned where you don't learn until just minutes before uh, the argument, and it became clear that we were going to have three GOP judges, uh, a George W. Bush appointee, a George H. W. Bush appointee, and a Trump appointee, which is a very unusual draw on the Fourth Circuit. Uh, it may become more common uh, in the years to come as the numerous Trump appointees uh, get onto the bench. But the Fourth Circuit is a court that had swung from being very conservative at one time uh, following the Reagan and Bush uh, and even Clinton years uh, to being a fairly liberal court uh, more recently. And so uh, the folks from D.C. and Maryland who are challenging Trump on these emoluments issues uh, knew they were in for a rough ride, and that's exactly what they got. When you reach adult life, you realize that what they teach you in civics about justice being blind isn't quite the case, and it looks like you saw the uh, uh, display, the illustration of that uh, today, that uh, there are uh, consequences following our elections. Tell folks what happens to this case now is whatever the Fourth Circuit determination is going to be the end of the line for this. 
Uh, I think it effectively could be the end of the line. Obviously, these three judges, uh, whatever resolution they come to, which I think will be throwing a significant hurdle in front of this case, uh, discovery, depositions, and subpoenas in this case are already on hold. Uh, it could be taken to the broader bench of the Fourth Circuit, but that all uh, takes time. And there are several other cases like this uh, that also seem to be moving at a rather glacial pace. And I have to say, after listening to the arguments, uh, and seeing uh, some of the lawyers involved here, the, the Attorney General of Maryland came in the courtroom and when he saw that panel, he literally slapped his hand against uh, his forehead um, in disbelief and his colleague from D.C. Uh, said to him, you know, keep your head up, keep your head up. So uh, it was pretty clear that they're f facing a very tough road uh, to hoe here and I really do wonder if the action on this emoluments issue may now move to the House of Representatives because they do have subpoena power and even if uh, the White House may be able to obstruct those kinds of subpoenas, uh, businesses, even like the Trump Organization, will have a harder time, I think, fighting a, a congressional action like that. That's a really interesting point. And I have to ask you, back to the story that uh, normally has you on this broadcast, what stood out to you today, uh, this book-length release of documents regarding the Michael Cohen case? Uh, yeah, I was really uh, interested in this um, murky question of what investigations are still going on here. Do the redacted portions of those documents uh, refer to President Trump? Uh, do they refer to other individuals? Particularly, are there other folks uh, in the Trump organization uh, who may have uh, equities in those documents? And also, the way we saw that there is some sort of continued role uh, for Robert Mueller here. I mean, we thought that a lot of this investigation had been handed off uh, to the prosecutors in Manhattan, but sort of reading between the blacked out lines, uh, it seems like there are still things there that do relate to ongoing Mueller issues. And uh, perhaps, as we've seen in some other court filings, that will all come to a head um, in the next few weeks, and, and there'll be more to be able to be said on these subjects. Josh Gerstein, always a pleasure having you on the broadcast. Thanks, Thanks for your Brian. work today and your reporting tonight. And coming up for us, the effort among Democrats to abolish the vehicle that delivered Donald Trump the U.S. presidency. Back with that story after this. This house is being requisitioned by the British government.